All right, I'm the author of Old King Graham, based on the uh, King's Quest series by the great Williams family, Roberta and uh, her husband, Ken Williams. I used a lot of the same backgrounds from uh, the original series. So this is the throne room from King's Quest One. I modified it a little bit to add in the extra throne there for Valenice. So you've got Valenice there, his wife. Got Alexander from uh, King's Quest Six and uh, and Three, and Rosella from King's Quest Four and uh, Seven in particular. The uh, writing style is a bit florid at the beginning. I tried to uh, make it as close to the original writing as I could. There's Cedric. Which, uh, I don't know, I liked as a kid. Um, he uh, was one of the main characters in King's Quest V and didn't exactly like help you on your journey the way he did in this one. But uh, I felt like it really set up the character for a really good arc that just like hadn't been completed yet. I kind of pictured Cedric as being like a 10 year old in, uh, in King's Quest V and in this one he's like 70 basically so he's been through a lot. He's uh, You learn later that he's playing it up a little bit here but uh, he's actually become a pretty powerful wizard. So one of the complaints about Cedric in King's Quest V is that he wasn't you know he wasn't like a big help the whole way through but uh, if you go back and, and look at that game, I, I think Cedric did play a good role in setting up certain scenes. So, like, in King's Quest IV, you would go off into some new areas, and you would just have to learn for yourself that they were dangerous, you know. But uh, in King's Quest V, at a few key moments, Cedric really warns Graham that there's a lot of danger out there, and it really... Uh, add some tension to those scenes I think so I think to a certain extent that Cedric did play a really important narrative role to uh, King's Quest V. Yeah Mermaid was featured in King's Quest II originally so uh, I disnified it a little bit but all these characters are kind of based on original characters You'll notice the flags waving up there, so uh, this is something that was in the original King's Quest 1. Which uh, was pretty amazing at the time to have animated backgrounds like that. And the tree over here to the right is uh, was in the original game, but I aged it up, made it a little bit bigger. Most of the Daventry screens are like from the original King's Quest 1, but I modified them in, in some way. Most of them, anyways. This one used to be a carrot garden in the original. It's a rose garden now. If you haven't seen uh, Pushing Up Roses videos on King's Quest, I recommend those for sure. This is Lake Maylai, where. Uh, Alexander was kidnapped before King's Quest 3 actually. Now Leprechauns were in the original game, inspired by the film. What's the name of that movie? Darby O'Gill, an old uh, Disney film. Yeah, the movie, the movie was okay. The best parts of that movie involved uh, this old Irishman and a battle of wits with uh, Leprechaun King. And they go back and forth, you know, trying to outsmart each other. So that's probably the best part of that movie. The dancing is from the original game. Frog, kind of a callback to King's Quest IV. There's nothing you can do here with this frog, but. Uh, you know, with this type of game, I think it's important to really 
stimulate the player's imagination. <clears throat> so the dwarves from King's Quest IV. The ones that uh, had their cottage cleaned by Rosella. I went through and made sure that all their like hats and shirts and belts and beards all matched up to the original dwarves. And uh, it's a monument to the dragon from King's Quest One. And that one, Graham uh, doesn't necessarily slay the dragon, but gets a bucket of water and extinguishes the fire. It's one of the hallmarks of King's Quest is that Graham doesn't necessarily have to kill the enemies, usually. He uh, just uses his mind, outsmarts them. So it's really a, a thinking man's game, I think. This is a reference to a uh, pretty notorious puzzle from King's Quest 1. <clears throat> You have to guess the gnome's name. And if you put Rumpelstiltskin, that's wrong. There's a clue that says it's uh, a... clue says to think backwards. So if you type in his name backwards, it's still wrong. You have to use a reverse alphabet cipher, which might have been more popular when the, uh, when the game came out, but pretty tough to figure out otherwise. So fans of the game probably wouldn't have too much trouble figuring that out. I programmed in the random like jittering uh, like he did in the original game. <clears throat> and by the way, Rumpelstiltskin was also in King's Quest 3 when... Um, no, I'm sorry, King's Quest 2, I think, when Graham comes back. Maybe it was 3. Yeah, King's Quest 3. So the gnome is like sitting on his porch, and then he's back again in King's Quest V. It's kind of implied that it's him. He's with his grandson. You give him his, uh, his spindle. Red Riding Hood was in King's Quest II, her grandmother. They were plagued by the uh, big bad wolf, which is now a rug on the ground. I always like these old mills. I've been in quite a few. You see the uh, it's pretty impressive wooden gears all inside. They're doing all kinds of things. So I thought it'd be fun to uh, play with that a little bit. I did a unique thing narratively with this game where the player is not told exactly what what they're doing. <laughs> Like, the main character knows more than the player does. So, you know, ostensibly you're getting a present for the mermaid, but Cedric's kind of figured out that Graham's up to something else. I think some people playing the game, to begin with, you know, think that it's a much smaller game than it actually is. You know, they think that it's just these screens and Daventry right here, but you wind up going out into... Uh, a much broader world later on. So, uh, this vines from King's Quest One, which is a beanstalk, of course, originally. And uh, this one's a lot easier to climb than the original. In the original, you had to uh, save it manually every time you made one centimeter of progress because you never knew when you were going to fall. Uh, Cedric's got your back this time. Catch his grammas. It's a giant rose. So in this particular playthrough, I didn't, uh, you know, you can look at different screens and uh, I decided not to do that like on every screen but pretty much every screen in the game you can look around and there's descriptions for it. One thing I like about the whole text parser as a game mechanic is that I feel like it really excites the player's imagination where like you never know exactly what's possible. 
you know, there's all these little things you can do that you can look at, that you can look under, you can discover little things. I'm doing kind of a speed run in this game, but there are like little things here and there you can do. You could have actually picked up the pickaxe from uh, one of the dwarves and used that for the same thing that you're going to use the hairpin for. So in King's Quest 2, it's implied that the uh, that Red Riding Hood's grandmother knows Dracula in that game. And you get a cloak and a ring from her, I think. And so the idea is that she also has this hairpin that she got from him that is imbued with some magical powers. And you start to get a clue that Cedric is actually a little more powerful than you even thought already. You definitely start to see more of a character shift in him at this point, which I really liked. Cedric was the first like pixel art that I drew um, for this game, and I really liked the way he turned out. It really gave me a lot of confidence going forward. After that, uh, it's from King's Quest Three, which uh, is an amazing game. It's narratively similar to Harry Potter, actually. It's about a young man in an adoptive household who uh, learns that he's capable of wielding magical powers. Although in King's Quest Three, he has to figure it out on his own and teach himself, basically. He's not able to just go off to some school. Uh, the screen's from King's Quest Three, and I modified it a little bit. I darkened the background. It used to be a lot brighter in the background. I had to go through on each shelf and make every little thing a little bit darker just so it would look a little bit better, I thought. And the uh, original King's Quest III was really unforgiving in the, in the spells you would, you would cast. You had to type it in like exactly like it was in the spell book or it would be a death screen. So in this game, it's pretty much impossible to die. There's like one way, but um, for the most part, Cedric takes care of you. In the original Sierra games, they were notorious for killing off the main character. Uh, I mean, about as much as Mario would get killed off, I guess. <clears throat> so in uh, King's Quest 3, Alexander makes uh, makes a magical cookie that he gives to uh, the wizard that's holding him captive and turns him into a cat. So this whole thing's a reference to that. I thought, you know, I just as I was making this game, I thought it was so amazing just to see Graham in Mananin's basement like this. I just thought it was so cool, like as a fan to. To see things like this. I really made this game for myself as much as anybody. I've got some good feedback from a few people so I think there's a few King's Quest fans out there that really enjoy this sort of thing. Cedric's not happy about it. This is where the game starts to uh, starts to really take a turn, and you finally kind of learn what the plot of the game is. You uh, start off at the beginning, staring into a, a youthful version of yourself, and I think most people playing the game would just think it was kind of like a cool little effect, but it actually does have a deeper significance in uh, in terms of what Graham's objective is. This is Graham as a um, knight on a grail quest. And I like this moment because you're like answering a question, like you're actually talking to him, like he's a character, which 
is not really something you can do with games currently. You know, you can't like have a conversation. The uh, text parser is pretty basic. I'm uh, looking for certain like key terms and what the player types. But uh, I, don't know, I feel like I had a pretty good idea as to like what people were going to be saying at different points of the game. But each room has its own like its own key terms. So this is uh, the only real exposition in the game. So in King's Quest 3, the villain is Mananen. In King's Quest 5, the villain is his brother, Mordak. And in this game, it's their father, which I created, which is Morgash. Uh, spoiler alert, Morgash and Crispin are actually twin brothers. So Crispin's vanished. It's left Cedric all alone as the strongest wizard in the land. There's a reference to uh, Cedric's most famous line about poisonous snakes. It's not the venomous snakes that will kill you, it's the poisonous ones. Now is that true? It can be. Uh, there was quite a few references to King's Quest 3. I really, really enjoyed the narrative in that game. One thing that was really great about it is the, the time component. So, uh, so Alexander was held captive in this house, and the wizard would vanish and go on like run different errands. And when he would come back, if he caught you doing something, he would kill you off. And if you played the game enough, you could figure out when he was going to come back. And so there would be this tension where, you know, the clock is counting down. You know, he's about to appear. You got to finish the spell that you're making or whatever. Uh, the game design is open world where the player has options and what they can do. They have freedom, which is a very special thing and something that they had in King's Quest from the beginning. It's something that is in Zelda games where you can wander pretty much wherever you want. And sometimes you can do dungeons out of order and uh, it's something that King's Quest really set up. In the original game, there were three treasures you had to obtain, and uh, you could do them in any order. And so there's 21 ingredients. So I'm going to play through and show you all 21, but you only have to get 10. And I kind of like this moment where you're going back to where you just came from. And now you really do know kind of like what you're doing, and where you're headed. And you've got like more of a sense of purpose, I think, than, uh, than the first time you climbed up that, that vine. And you also maybe know how to navigate up there. So the player's kind of feeling like they're more in control now. Grimm's costume is influenced by the 2015 King's Quest. I put in a few references to it, although I don't necessarily treat treat that game as canon exactly. This big white piece of paper in the back, by the way, was in the original King's Quest 3. Also maps in that game, so I felt like I was kind of tying things together with that. And 
man, this right here is probably my favorite point in the game. So when you play the game, there's a map you can click on at the bottom, which is right here. And the player probably would have looked at it already and just thought it was like a fun little artifact to look at. But at this point in the game, they realize that they can actually go to all these places. It's the Fairy Island from King's Quest IV. Rosella's Adventure. Queen Janesta. And you can also ask her about the Holy Grail as well. She'll uh, respond. Most of the people, if you ask them about the Holy Grail, they'll like not believe that it's real, you know. You have to kind of investigate where it might be. So you get the ingredients, and uh, you can go ahead and put them in the mortar and pestle one at a time. I just wait and do it later. Where to next? Tamir, it's also King's Quest IV, it's the original Rosella Sprite, the only rose without thorns is our Rosella, very sweet, and Zeus has never been in one of the King's Quest games, they have all these references to uh, Greek mythology, but I thought I'd finally put him in this pool. Originally, you see Cupid hanging around. <clears throat> Cedric's the Sword of Graham. Cedric's like the sheriff, basically. So after uh, after King's Quest V, him and Crispin were going around and kind of setting the world right. They were uh, basically arresting all the witches and warlocks around and trying to bring peace to the Wild West, I guess. Cedric got a lot of respect uh, at that point. It's a random gnome in a hot air balloon. These games are very whimsical, so I don't know, I tried to put in fun little things like that. A few things maybe you haven't seen before, like little, you know, cutesy little things. Kind of building the lore a little bit. You know, you can think of like a whole backstory on the, on the gnome and why he's in a hot air balloon. The Monastery of the Blessed Wilbury from King's Quest II. I made this nighttime. Originally, it was daytime. So, in uh, King's Quest II, you find a monk here, and he gives you a cross that will protect you from Dracula. And so, here's Dracula. Seeking repentance. Well, this was a beautiful little moment here. And this is where Graham and Valenice get married at the end of uh, King's Quest II as well. You don't see that many vampires that are remorseful. You know, maybe in the uh, Twilight series, you know, there's like some good vampires and some vampire vampires, but uh, in this one, I thought it was a nice little turn for Dracula there. Normally they just get killed off though, but I felt like uh, this ending for Dracula was more in keeping with the whole King's Quest philosophy of outsmarting villains or turning them good in some way when you can. I'm 
This is where the uh, conclusion of King's Quest II was. Graham rescues Valenice from the from the ivory tower. This is one of the trickier puzzles in the game. <clears throat> I um, this is one where you have to go to more than one area. And if you don't really look around and investigate, it'd be tough to figure it out. Trying to gauge the difficulty of this game was kind of a tricky thing because you don't want to make it too hard. I wouldn't say this is necessarily at uh, the merciless Sierra level of difficulty, but uh, there are a couple of tricky little areas. And there's some that are really straightforward where you pretty much get the ingredient right away, but others where things are spread out. You have to do a little bit of puzzling. But a player should be able to complete it just regardless of their ability. Just because you have so many options. But, you know, I could have done it where, like, every area you have to go to somewhere else and they're all interconnected so that you basically have to go everywhere to get the 10 ingredients. But, uh, I don't know. I felt like I didn't want to slow down the momentum of the game that much. You know, I wanted you to be able to just kind of, like, rush around and see all these cool little areas and then go on to the next one. Pirate King was not in a previous game, but there were some pirates in King's Quest 3 that had a uh, buried treasure. This is one of the secret areas. There's a few little secret areas in here that I threw in. This dragon was drawn on the map, which uh, I got that map from the uh, King's Quest wiki, and they got it from the official King's Quest companion. Although originally it was black and white, and I put the canvas behind it, so it would look like an official map. This is a classic inventory puzzle. which is a big part of King's Quest games, is figuring out like which item to put where. Although normally you have to go over, you know, 10 different screens to find what you need. It's kind of tricky to get the screen to flip like right at that moment. I had to do a little programming trick to make that work. So when I made this game, the toughest screens were the first, the first like three screens. The toughest was that first Cedric screen with the cage, because I just had to figure out how to how to set it up. Because you're flipping backgrounds with the key showing up and going away, and the cage going away. I had to figure out the dialogue interaction and everything, but. Once I had that screen set up, I knew that I could do the whole game. I had the text parser working and everything. It's a little Easter egg for another little area we'll look at later. I made this game extremely quickly, looking back on it. Um, I made this whole game in 32 days. I wrote 10,590 lines of code. JavaScript and uh, in 32 days I uh, worked on this game over 12 hours a day my uh, goal every day was to do at least two screens and there were quite a few days where I was able to do more and then after I got those two screens at least I'd um, work on the artwork for the next day 
but there were some days where I could knock out, you know, four or five, just depended. But yeah, it was it was a lot. You know, it was really a time when I was really inspired. I um just like pretty much knew exactly what I wanted the whole thing to be like really early on and just had to had to do all the coding for it but when you get those moments of inspiration like that you know you gotta take advantage of it because you'll be like you'll be so productive I really like that you know you can go to any little area on here It's King's Quest VI, the Isle of Wonder. I feel like this is the most iconic island to go to. A rotten Tomato. This is the Garden of Puns. It's called Photosynthesis, look it up. These are all from um, Alexander's original adventure. This is one of my favorite screens here uh, because I, I like, did all the pixel art to make it look like the original screen, but you know the original King's Quest VI had much smaller pixels, was much more detailed, and I experimented with taking the original picture and converting it down into more of like an 8-bit look, but it never would look exactly right and so finally I just had to go in myself and paint all the pixels from scratch which turned out looking a lot better here's a little Easter egg that some people might be able to figure out on their own that you can open up all kinds of doors not just the uh, one in the tower this is a brand new screen with uh, brand new little puns Yeah, I felt like I could have done another screen like that, but I think one, one's enough, I guess. So the screen is from King's Quest 3. There were bees in King's Quest 5 originally. There's a bear trying to steal the honey and Graham lures the bear away. But on this one she just sends you out on a fetch quest to uh, an obscure area that I felt like the uh, player might have overlooked otherwise. Took me a while to do the animation for that screen. So I don't know. I felt I felt like I should send a player over there to check it out. But what I really like about it is uh, it shows Cedric's power really at the end when he uh, stops all the water. So Daventry is on a uh, flat Earth confirmed here. The original idea is that this whole story takes place in the 1400s in England, but I think later on it kind of morphed into uh, being its own little magical world. This game came out, so yeah, Cedric is pretty powerful. This game came out in 1983, and Zelda didn't come out until 1986, so it was Pretty impressive that uh, the game looked as good as it did in 83. It didn't have as many screens as Zelda did. 
but in a lot of ways it was it was superior even they uh in the original game they had a really good boundary control where you could go like right up to the edge of objects and it was like pixel perfect boundaries whereas if you play the original zelda if you try and move link against a wall you'll notice that he never actually like hits the wall a lot of the time he's like a centimeter away from it and he's just bumping up against empty space they really went all out with that original game really with every game so one of the hallmarks of the king's quest series is they were always trying to top themselves in the and like their mastery of the technology so they were always pushing the graphics forward king's quest 3 and especially onwards um roberta williams and ken williams they started off with the first graphical adventure and um pretty much ended their careers with before they retired with full motion video and um Phantasmagoria in the mid 90s so they really took the medium like really far and even farther in some respects than a lot of the popular games today you know a lot of the popular games in 2020 kind of looked like they were made in the late 90s after going for that aesthetic but the computing power was advancing so fast that uh you know, they never really slowed down to do more of the same thing. They were always, like, pushing the limit graphically. So they, I just feel like they never would have made a game like this, actually, that especially that looks like this, uh, you know. If they were going to do a, a King's Quest Nine or something, it probably would be full motion video, like like an interactive movie or something like that. The serpent from King's Quest IV, and the uh, fruit is unripe because it takes a hundred years to mature this particular fruit, which saved Graham's life in King's Quest IV. But uh, this game takes place around like 50 years after uh, after King's Quest IV, so the fruit's still unripe. But you can tempt the serpent. Cedric does make a reference to uh, the snake being poisonous if you talk to him. I just didn't do it on this playthrough. Serenia says King's Quest V. There was just one one ant bed at uh, at that time. Now there's two. I always thought it was strange that in that game there was an ant king that you talked to, but you know ants of course they have queens. They don't necessarily have a king. They'll have several drones and uh, and the queen. So I put some queens in this one. And this mushroom that looks like this was in King's Quest 1. And in that one, you eat the mushroom to escape from the Leprechaun Kingdom. But you eat the mushroom. I took this sprite like from that. I drew it based on that. And um, But you don't really get to do much as a shrunken gram. And so I definitely wanted to include that in here where you actually get to like walk around and interact with things as as a miniature being this is a reference to king's quest 5 where uh notoriously you save a rat's life by throwing a boot at a cat and if you don't there's no way you can beat the game later on which happened to me actually i got stuck in king's quest 5 at that point and uh luckily I had an old save game i could go back to i had to call in on the sierra hotline you had to pay money, you had to call in to get a tip, there's no internet. So if you wanted a hint, you had to pay the Sierra Corporation good money for that information. 
So yeah, I had to go back, save the rat. And then in that game, he, when you get captured in the end, the rat comes and uh, gnaws the ropes away and saves you. So all these years later, you're kind of returning the favor for the rat's descendant. So I, uh, I definitely wanted players to check out that area. I like the Serenia Desert area. Originally on this one, I had a, um, a maze that Graham would go through. Like he would go in the ant colony and there'd be like all these little twists and turns to navigate through. It was like you were actually in an ant bed, but uh, it was getting kind of late in making the game, and I just didn't want to be bogged down making all the all the boundaries for it, so I kind of left that out. This is one of the trickier screens where you have to phrase things in just the right way. But the text parser is looking for a, a few key terms like um, queen, truce, and bakery. Bakery was in King's Quest V. It's where you buy the pie to uh, defeat the Yeti later on. And the Gnome House was uh, Rumpelstiltskin's house in uh, King's Quest V. I, uh, you know, there were a lot of little things that you know you could have done with Graham being small like that, but I, don't know. I thought about having Graham eat another mushroom, like when he was small, and he would get like even smaller, like he would be on the cellular scale, and then Cedric would rescue him. But and this happened the first time when I was testing the game, like I forgot that he would still be small like this. This was like so funny when I saw it the first time. And, uh, yeah, the first time I did it, you could actually keep playing the game and he would be, like, tiny like that. Like, you could play the rest of the game tiny. But, um, I don't know. I feel like it was a little too silly. I had to, uh, remind myself, like, 20 times when I was writing this that, uh, this isn't a Monkey Island game. You know, I like being kind of funny and, uh, Definitely had to cut back on the on the silly stuff. So in the original game, King's Quest V, you can get trapped in here and there's like nothing you can do, so. And you couldn't get these treasures back then either, so I definitely like wrote that in there that you can get the treasure this time. There was a genie in King's Quest II. Graham made his wishes on uh, Kalima. This genie, I think, is maybe a cousin to uh, the one in King's Quest V that was in a bottle, not a lamp, in V. So maybe he's part of the uh, part of the family. I thought about making him blue, like um, like the Disney version, but I don't know. I like the look. I wanted to include as many references to the original as I could.
Yeah, I played around with the day and the night. Some of the screens, I just felt like they looked better at nighttime, so. These maps are kind of wild in their handling of space and time. These are original uh, original riddles in this. It's a pearl. It's blub blub. I feel like that's a Zelda thing, blub blub. Like when a character's underwater. Daventry. There's a lot of stuff I could have done with Daventry. But I thought I would include the whale. I'm sorry, the the well and the dragon. So the dragon doesn't talk in the original King's Quest one or three. Although it does talk in seven. There's a dragon that talks. But, I don't know, I gave it just some uh, arcane dialect, some weird accent. It's a reference to the mirror that Graham recovers from the dragon in King's Quest I. He originally recovers a uh, mirror from a dragon, a treasure from a giant, the one that was uh, a skeleton. And he also gets a shield from a Leprechaun King that we'll actually meet later on in this game. It's like we're going to Neptune's Kingdom. It's, um, so this is from King's Quest 2, which came out probably around 85 or so. Which was several years before The Little Mermaid came out. And, uh... I wonder if, like, to, to some extent, maybe if this influenced that movie, I don't know. It does have Neptune and the Mermaid. Although these are all, you know, from the original fairy tales, but... I feel like there's probably some Disney people that played King's Quest. He's got his trident as well. Then he'll actually kill Graham if you do the wrong thing in uh, King's Quest too. So this screen in particular has some uh, significance for me because this is where my King's Quest IV game ended on this area. So originally you would get swallowed and you had to climb out and just like Otar says it's impossible to climb the thing. It's kind of like the vine in, in the first game where you have to save it after every centimeter because you'll lose your grip and fall at any moment. And my problem was, I was able to get to the top, but you had to have a feather to tickle the whales. By the way, the teeth on this whale like bear no resemblance to an actual whale's teeth. But uh, like these are <laughs> flat molars. Maybe it's a herbiv herbivorous whale, I guess. But I didn't have the feather, and so I couldn't get out. And you know, being a kid playing it, I used a different save game you know that was my first King's Quest game so I didn't know any better so I was using a different save slot for every every save game and so I wound up where every saved game was within that whale and so there was no way for me to make any progress you know without just restarting which you know is a shame with that difficulty level it's like on the one hand it's a really great challenge but on the other hand you know I never got to see half that game as a kid. And looking back, I mean, to restore my progress would have only taken me probably 30 minutes of, of playtime, right? But it was just the frustration of like having 
put so much time into it because in reality I had spent probably a week, you know, just like trying to make progress in that game and then to be stuck like that, I just stopped and went back to playing Zelda. King Otar was in King's Quest Seven with uh, Rosella. She had all kinds of adventures uh, with Otar. So one uh, one thing that is in a lot of King's Quest games is the main character flying at some point in uh, King's Quest 2 he flies on a magic carpet and um, King's Quest 3 there's like a eagle or something and um, King's Quest 5 Graham himself is flying around King's Quest 6 you're riding on uh, on a Pegasus and I think in 7 as well right or on a dragon maybe in 7 it's been a while since I played that one so yeah I like that hero shot to uh, to do the pixel art on these horses most of the time I would just draw the characters from scratch using a pixel art website um, but uh, for this one I took a picture of an actual horse and shrunk it down like super small and then like the shading would all be off so I painted over it with, um, with like more solid colors but uh, yeah I thought the Horse King and the Pegasus turned out pretty well. The other Pegasus anyways. Just because it was based on a real horse. But yeah, they put a lot of a lot of work in these backgrounds. It definitely saved me so much time like using their backgrounds or just changing them slightly. I mean this game would have taken you know extra months if I was doing all the backgrounds from scratch I'm sure and man King's Quest 5, 6 they only got more and more detailed like really really impressive artwork they were putting into their work yeah if you haven't looked at screenshots from King's Quest 5 or 6 you should google that check them out Just especially for the time really impressive artistry and King's Quest 2015 actually um, had some really some really moving screens put some hard work into that so I did like some of the narrative stuff they put into um, King's Quest 2015 I felt like uh, the actors were amazing in that game and the backgrounds were staggeringly beautiful but uh, there were a couple of like overarching just like story making sort of things that I didn't like they um, in chapter one retold the story of Graham ascending to the throne and in their version Graham cheats his way to uh, to the crown originally he you know, was a triumphant hero and rescued these treasures that had been captured, but in their version, Graham is a cheater, which I felt like fundamentally undermines his, uh, his reign, so I didn't like that. And um, also in King's Quest Chapter 5, again, this is like the 2015 reboot that was not done by Roberta Williams, but they decided to have Graham... Um, get Alzheimer's and die in bed, which uh, is maybe not the most heroic story for Graham. So I feel like, you know, it's just narratively, it's always easier to tear something down than it is to build it up. You know, it's it's a real challenge to take a hero and try and, you know, just 
to try and match them, you know, or to even make them greater, you know, that's the real artistic challenge is to uh, take a great hero and try and make them even greater. But just lately, I think it's been the vogue to take old heroes and kind of tear them down. Unfortunately. So I had the idea for this game before I played 2015 King's Quest. I, I thought of this actually when I played the original King's Quest. Um, I started making this game probably less than a month after I played King, King's Quest 1 and 2 for the first time. Uh, I just love love those games so much and just was left wanting more. And so I, I did play uh, 2015 King's Quest and uh, my jaw dropped when in Chapter 5 there is a part where you actually go back and you you play as old Graham. Although the little mini game only goes on for like four screens before they end it. But, uh, you know, it, when I saw that, like... And I was so blown away, I, I knew that I had to do it. I did have the idea for it before that, though. So this is a reference to the classic King's Quest Moon logic where, you know, it's the mid-90s, there's no internet. It's the early 90s, even. And, uh, you know, you're stuck trying to solve some puzzle, and there's, like, no way you could really necessarily figure it out logically you just have to look in your inventory and try every single item that you have and try and use it with everything else so you have to put a bridle on a snake of course and then it turns into a unicorn why not right there's a Graham constellation in the background there it's written in the stars and if you look at the blue aliens in the back those were in uh, it was one of those in King's Quest 5 where there's a random trans-dimensional alien that shows up out of nowhere and is never referenced again in another King's Quest game. Uh, but it, there's just an alien wandering around in Mordax Castle, so I wanted to uh, tie that together. So that's how, they, uh, that's how they got to the castle through the uh, machine. And if you look at the top there, I don't know if you saw it in space, but those were the fates that were in uh, King's Quest Seven. Valenice visited. So we're off to Ludor now, which is actually where we are right now. Uh, we're in the basement. There was originally some chicken coops there, but uh, I got rid of that. And the um, three bears were um, in King's Quest Three but they were living down on the lowland in a little cottage. So now they're living in the mansion up on the hill. Put some little puns in there, no cookies. King's Quest didn't have too many of the puns. I uh, just threw in a couple every now and again. One thing I like about the original series and one thing that I really tried to stray, stay true to is how seriously the characters treat one another and how they treat themselves. That's the uh, actual background actually from King's Quest 3 like inside the house. But yeah, the characters definitely have a lot of respect for one another in the King's Quest series and uh, so I definitely wanted to carry on that tradition in this game and really you know, have everyone treating everyone else with a lot of seriousness and uh, King's Quest 5 Cedric is too afraid to go into the town because he says there's some uh, some scary dogs there so this is uh, Cedric's full circle moment where he's uh, hanging out with the dog. And this girl was in the original King's Quest V. She was the little girl in the toy shop and you give her the marionette. 
And now she's a uh, toy maker. I think I actually put her in the the outside background is from the tailor shop, I think. So I just like that background, so I moved her in there. So you can look at all the little characters. I don't I didn't look at all of them in this playthrough, but you can look at Cosima's back there and um a dragon. A unicorn rocking horse. A rocking unicorn. From uh, King's Quest IV. The Minotaur from six. Harry Potter reference. I don't know if J.K. Rowling played this game, but uh, there's definitely a lot of similarities. But I mean, I'm sure it could have been independently developed. Everybody's got a lot of respect for Cedric. Yeah, I liked Cedric a lot as a kid. I was kind of surprised. It wasn't until, like, I don't know, 10, 15 years later, I would hear from people that didn't like Cedric. But, yeah, I always thought he was kind of, kind of interesting as a kid. A little sidekick, which not a lot of, a game, a lot of games had like a little sidekick character to go along with you. Um, I think after after King's Quest V, they had a Zelda game where Link is going around with a little Navi fairy. There's been other games as well. They'll have like a dog as a sidekick or something. But at the time, there were not that many games. They were doing the whole sidekick thing. There was originally an extra screen in here that was just like a dock that you have to walk straight across, but I just didn't want to make the player walk all the way out there. So maybe part of it got knocked down in a storm or something. And this part right here is just an Easter egg. You don't have to actually do this, but you know, I figured once people got the lockpick that some people might think that maybe they could use it on the door, so. I wanted to go ahead and reward people for thinking creatively like that. So I love spirits. It's, it's the Isle of Spirits. Her uh, garb is based on the outfit of the original barmaid. Shopkeeper looks a lot like the Adventure Game Geek. He's uh, done a couple of good YouTube videos on, on the King's Quest series. This um, logic puzzle right here is uh, one of the more challenging ones, I guess. It's based on logic puzzles that they'll put on like some standardized tests, like the, the law school LSAT in the US, or in England, they would call them barristers, but the entrance exam has a, a lot of logic puzzles like this you have to solve, so. This one is an original I made up. And it might be a little tricky, but once you actually look at it, you'll realize that it's uh, just a process of elimination. It's basically telling you the ones you have to cross out. the AGG likes that reference um, and there was a reference at the end to uh, cave water there's a screen that I did not include in this game from King's Quest 3 that looks amazing it's um it's King's Quest 3 on the lowland and there's um, it's like the camera is like inside of a cave looking out and there's this like little waterfall pouring down 
and uh, it's coming down like right in front. But like the foreground art was really great. Really uh, had a really great like animation on it. I thought it looked looked really nice. This is the Leprechaun King from King's Quest One. This is all like extra stuff. You don't have to actually do this, but this is just for fun. There's a key word he mentioned earlier, which is traveler. If you look in the background, there's uh, spirits in the back. So yeah, key keyword was traveler. So you're uh, listing the creatures from the least number of legs to the most. I like that pixel art uh, rainbow. It actually turned out better than I thought it would when I made it. And I don't do it in this playthrough, but you can go back to the leprechauns, the original Daventry, and, uh, and tell them that you'll get a special little message from the leprechaun king. says, uh, if you're going to be alive, be lively. And leprechauns dance around. I thought about doing more things like that, like little things where you could go back to the um, original Daventry and like interact with the characters in new ways. But, I don't know. It's one of those games where, you know, I could just like keep adding and adding and building and building. So you got to stop somewhere. But, uh, you know, it's a great thing about the series is it really, like, as a designer, brings out a lot of creativity, but also as, you know, a player, you know, you're always thinking about all the possibilities, you know, like so many ways you can interact with things. So we're going back here because this is another little Easter egg area. No reward other than extra bits added on to the narrative. Just building more and more of the uh, of the lore. So this is a uh, burned out dark magic stronghold that Crispin and Cedric had ripped apart. So right now, this is 2020. Um, the King's Quest IP is owned by a company called Activision. They're probably the fourth or fifth company to own it by now, I guess. So uh, Roberta and Ken sold the rights to King's Quest when it was at its height, at its most popular. I think they made a ton of like a, over a billion dollars or something off of it, I don't know. But I think they literally did get like over a billion dollars for it, which is pretty crazy. And then after that, the whole like adventure game genre really went downhill, became less popular. And so um, the rights to King's Quest got bandied about, I guess, from company to company and uh, currently they're owned by Activision who did a reboot in 2015 with little installments coming out throughout 2016 and I think it finished up in 2017 but uh, as of now there hasn't been any official King's Quest in, in several years but you know there's all kinds of like little things they could do with the series you know like I think they spent a lot of money on the uh, on the reboot, which really shows in the artwork they put into it. But um, you know, you don't have to do like a blockbuster with every game. You can do you know stuff for the fans. It's really like quality, but it doesn't cost ten million dollars, right? 
And this little area I included, uh, this was not part of the original game. I put it in like a week after I actually published it originally. Right now it's uh, July 9th. But uh, I was talking to a guy that runs the King's Quest Wiki who played the game. It goes by the name of Baggins. And uh, he suggested I added a couple of new areas from... Uh, King's Quest 6, so I threw this in there. It's got some references to King's Quest 8 as well. If you haven't seen the original art for uh, Lord Samhain, you should check it out. It's uh, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> it's uh, I remember the first time I played King's Quest 6, Samhain was in. Um, yeah, it's really the stuff of nightmares. Uh, there was some really dark artwork. It was so drastically different from the whimsical scenes from King's Quest 4 and 5. Wow, this guy is like chained in a chair. His horns are growing all over the place. It's crazy. And Azrael is from King's Quest 8, who is also a judge in the Land of the Dead. This is like purgatory, basically. But... Ezreal is doing the same basic job as Sam Hain, I guess, but in a different game. I don't know. But I guess maybe there's, in the uh, King's Quest Underworld, maybe there's different, different lands, kind of like there are in the Overworld. This is just another little, like, side Easter egg area you can go to that Ezreal mentioned. This is all from King's Quest Eight, which is not considered one of, like, the best games although I went back I haven't played the full game but I did go back and look at the ending of it like the last 15 20 minutes and um because I want to put in some references to the mask of eternity and um you know it's they were trying to do like a first person shooter kind of thing where you're going around and um kind of like golden eye except you've got a sword instead of guns but I will say they did actually include some some puzzles in there and uh, they included some lore in there so you know they didn't completely abandon like the uh, the spirit of King's Quest but it was definitely yeah it just did not look good and uh, yeah maybe the writing wasn't all there but uh, it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. <laughs> I do like the lore of the uh, the Realm of the Sun. So that was Edward there. You can uh, try and bow to him like you did in the original King's Quest 1. Um, but yeah, he's the king that originally sent Graham on his, on his journey. And this fish was drawn on the map. I thought it'd be funny to have somebody fishing off of the fish. The irony. Originally I had this satyr um, like skiing behind the fish, but I actually did this bright artwork for it as well, but I thought this would be funnier. Or at least more ironic. This is one of those where you have to go to more than one area. I just felt like I had to add a little bit extra to this. I didn't want it to be like too simple every time. But again, you know, I could have had, you know, I could have set it up so that like you had to, you know, you had to find some bait somewhere else and then give it to him, but you know, I didn't want to I kinda like didn't want the player to uh go to like two or three areas in a row where they just like don't know what to do. I wanted them to be, you know, making regular progress.
Originally the satire was on Tamir, King's Quest 4. It's one of those areas, this uh this island I never got to see in King's Quest 4 because I was stuck in the whale. Alright, so finally and you know we did more than twice as much work as you would really have to do with this, but I want to show everybody the full game. I um planning on doing more adventure games in the future. It's not a genre that's very popular right now. Um, like at this point in time, most, like I would say most people under age 30 have never heard of uh, King's Quest at all. Which is kind of a shame. It's, we're at a time actually where there's a, there's been like a growing appreciation for these old retro games. Um, you know, like even even ten year olds know who Mario is. They know about the Legend of Zelda. They're still making quality games in that series, but you know, most are even familiar with the original games. They're playing them on emulators or just on the latest Nintendo console. Um, you know, they know who Sonic is. But uh King's Quest in the early nineties was like the most popular computer series. I mean it's kind of crazy, but I mean, it was as popular, I think, as Mario. It was as popular as Zelda. Like, every everyone that played computer games at all, they knew about King's Quest. And uh, it's kind of crazy that it's kind of disappeared. But I think it's going to be, you know, I think there's a really, like, an opportunity for um, a lot of stories to be told this way. I'm an, an author by trade, so it's, it's kind of a natural fit for me, and I like to program in my spare time, so this kind of project was just the right fit for me. This game was uh, free to play on my website. Um, there's nothing to download, you can play it all in the browser. Which I really like that you can go to the website and just like immediately start playing. Nothing to download. No login. You don't have to submit your email or anything. You can just like start playing the game. I came up with a little uh, save game mechanic so that you don't have to have any like cookies on your system or anything. So I was hoping that this part would be a surprise to people. I was hoping it would catch people off guard because there, there is an ice palace in a um, previous game, a couple of previous games. There's Isabella from King's Quest V. They had an ice palace in the um, remake as well. It's the North Pole. I made Santa really big, which you don't normally see Santa portrayed as huge like that. Although he is like that in, um, in um, Charles Dickens' Christmas Tale. But uh, I don't know, I really liked the way he looked because um, it made Graham look like a small child. say thanks all right so you can finally put the elixir in the grail um, the other well-known story involving a grail is Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade which was a great movie and um, and that one he drinks from the grail Nothing really happens to him. He's able to save his father's life, but uh, you know, I, I kind of thought it would have been cool in that movie if he became younger at the end of that movie because that movie starts with him being portrayed as young, played by the Great River Phoenix, and uh, 
So something they could have done is have him actually turn young at the end like this. But uh, I don't know. I don't think I don't think audiences would have liked that to see somebody other than Harrison Ford. So here's Graham from King's Quest V with his uh, ripped back muscles. <laughs> And here he is with a spring in his step again. King's Quest 1 and 2. So there was a tree there that uh, I had to destroy just so you could see Mordak in the background. And there's the flags are all limp. Cedric's got his staff. This is a really sweet moment I think you know Cedric and King's Quest 5 saved Graham's life got hit by Mordak spell and um, I think it's a really beautiful moment right here where Cedric is uh, it's always looking after Graham Really great to have, you know, friendship like this in a game. That's the spell he would use to catch Graham when he would fall. I think that's really beautiful. Alright, so we're back, and I think uh, hopefully the player realizes what the uh, image in the mirror was all about. You can bow again. It took me like a day to, uh, it took me a whole day of just doing the bow animation. The original games had quite a few animations in them, especially like King's Quest 4 and 5. Um, it takes a lot of work to do these animations. I've definitely got a lot of appreciation for, for all the work they put into this. There's Valenice. Back to her uh, King's Quest II self. Prince Alexander. Looking like uh, King's Quest VI again. And Rosella's got her King's Quest IV dress on. I would like to see a Rosella fan game made at some point. Or how about an actual game would be amazing. So yeah, I had to put something there to uh, to get the player to go outside. <laughs> it's a poignant moment with the cage. So yeah, I really had a fun time making this game. I, um, you know, I did it so fast. So like every day I was working on a new area. It was, um, uh, you know, very nostalgic for me. I played these as a kid, and you know, we play games like that. Spend a lot of time on them. They're just kind of like there in the back of your mind, and kind of capture a moment in time. So uh, this is the whole cast right here. So the um, player, if they only got the 10 ingredients, they'd have a little taste of all the other little areas that are out there. It's like if they didn't find the um, one of the bears, he's right there. Which by the way, that was uh, Baby Bear's family all grown up uh, in the house. If you look on the bridge, there's the uh, Rotten Tomato. So everybody's young again, right? There's um, Little Cedric in the middle. I've got Cosima and Edgar over there and threw in the uh, grandchildren as well. 
Rumpelstiltskin's got a black beard again. So, I hope you all uh, enjoyed this commentary. I'll um, probably post more videos in the future. I, you know, very much grew up with uh, you know, great books and also great video games. And it's been really amazing getting to see games progress as I got older. Um, I really feel like I'm part of a video game generation where um, for Christmas when I was five I got uh, the original Nintendo in 1986 and then um, I guess it was like five years later I got the uh, Super Nintendo and then when I was around 15 or so I got the uh, Nintendo 64 with a full 3D Mario and so you know got to see like so much progress in such a relatively short amount of time it's, it's been pretty amazing so um, I hope to make more games in the future but uh, this was a really really amazing experience so I hope you enjoyed it all right. Thank you, everybody.